Hello and welcome back to our third episode of In The Wall with me, Parker Kligerman. And here at In The Wall, it's all about you guys. You are in the driver's seat, but we know we can't please everyone. So right off the top, we want to holler at a few people who are trying to holler at us, who's writing this, especially the crew chief. Here is your attention. So from YouTube comments, always a scary place, six days ago, no, I won't let you know that I disagree due to the fact that you won't pay any attention to what I have to say. Uh, disproven, Mr. Crew Chief. We just put you front and center at the beginning of the show. You also commented six days ago, so twice. You seem to like what we're doing. You are annoying in a Jay Leno kind of way, question mark. Uh, thanks for the question. You want me to answer that, I guess? Um, you know what? I appreciate the question raised by the crew chief, and I'll say yes. I would like to be compared to a successful TV personality with a huge, and I mean huge, garage full of nice cars worth millions of dollars. That would be kind of nice, and I could live that life. So, in late night show fashion, we're going to give you a countdown of great, then there's this, moments. We were inspired by Dylan Bassett at Iowa this past weekend when he did this. Here he is coming in and directly in to up. a sweeper truck. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that there was a lot of cleanup dust there moving around. The sun was probably in his eyes. Couldn't really see, but that's quite a moment that will live on in infamy. So moving on to our next honorable mention must go to this ambulance in the way during the regular season finale at Richmond in 2017. So here they come onto pit road. There's an ambulance there as they open pit road. And this causes a bunch of cars to run into each other, including this on board here with Matt Kenseth. Oh, this would force him into the garage, ending his night really in many ways. Sort of a PR disaster for NASCAR and that ambulance driver probably never thought in his wildest dreams he'd have an outcome in the race. Hmm. Number three goes to the pace car that caught on fire at the Daytona season opening exhibition race in 2014. I had forgotten about this one, but this is quite a moment here. Sort of a PR disaster as well, maybe for Chevy to have your car actually catch on fire while leading the field of race cars. That's supposed to be reserved for race cars. You shouldn't have your road car catch on fire. I'm sure they had to look at that one. You can see sort of the damage that was done there in the trunk. Maybe they had to look at some of the wiring back there. All right, number two goes to Juan Pablo Montoya slamming into a jet dryer at the Daytona 500 in 2012. He's won two Indy 500s and the Monaco Grand Prix, yet he'll always be remembered for that moment. Here it is, the left rear truck arm, I believe, if I remember correctly, broke. Maybe they were doing some interesting things. There's the remnants of the 42 car. And there is the jet dryer that was actually on fire. It was so hot and the intensity of the burn was so large that they actually had to find ways to clean that. And I think I remember them using Tide or something like that. Um, and this always lends itself to the joke. How many drivers does it take to take out a jet dryer? Just one. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. All right. And on to number one, or one, goes to last year's pace car crash before the IndyCar race at Belle Isle in Detroit. That's a Chevy Corvette ZR1. And I'm sure the GM executive driving the car knows exactly how much damage was caused. Oh, that's ugly. I've driven one of those cars. They can be a little squirrely in the back, especially on cold tires. And on an undulation like that course has off of that turn, I could see how he could lose it. But talk about embarrassing. Hmm, yeah, not sure about that one. All right, so here are some of the things that caught my eye in motorsports this past week, starting with IndyCar. They announced hybrid engines are now officially coming to IndyCar in 2022. This is exciting because they've talked about how much horsepower they're gonna have. They're gonna have roughly 900 plus horsepower. They're gonna use that hybrid to have a higher amount of push to pass. I think in their respect, although I kind of have not always agreed with it in the NASCAR world, I think for them being prototype race cars, it does make a bit of sense and they're using it for the right reasons. I like it. Go ahead, IndyCar. Sounds like a cool thing. So I'm going to agree with this change and this move forward by IndyCar for 2022 because the cars will be going faster. Who doesn't like fast race cars? All right. Uh, this is in news that I hate to report. NASCAR forced Mike Mar Marlar to remove marathon logos at the Eldora race because of sponsorship conflicts. 
last night in practice. And this is the sort of thing that really grinds my gears because in an era where sponsorship is so hard to come by, where it's the only revenue source for race teams, for a sanctioning body to be restricting the sponsors that they can have because of official sponsors for the series, that's got to go. It's old-fashioned. It doesn't work anymore. We've got to find a new way. I hope the powers that be at NASCAR look at this. In the coming years, we can change this because it just doesn't make sense. Also, speaking of not making sense, something occurred in Australian V8 supercars this past weekend when Scott McLaughlin won. He was able to make these great, I guess, fake news platforms here or sort of posters. Well, you know what, this, what happened? He was fined $10,000 for doing this, which doesn't make any sense. Well, you know what? DJR Team Penske has decided to sell these posters in response to that, and all the proceeds will go to children's cancer charity, Camp Quality. I like that. That's a great way to respond to a ridiculous set of rules. Uh, moving on to the world of Formula One. Now, if you were watching the Hockenheim race, the German GP, you got to maybe see some of the cars like this, Nico Hockenberg's Renault, which was covered in water. It looks like it's about to drive directly into the ocean which is a cool thing, um, and it was a great show. And rain always kind of causes a great show in Full One because it mixes up, it's the great equalizer. And after this, I got a lot of tweets and questions out there, people inevitably asking, what about NASCAR racing in the rain? Well, we've seen it in the Xfinity Series on road courses. We know that Cup will do it on road courses, yet, although we're yet to see it. But it always goes back to the question of, could we race on ovals in the rain? Uh, and whenever I bring this up, I should preface it with to say that I'm always asked, am I on crazy pills? Because people think that's just not possible, that they can't happen. And if you're a frequent viewer of this show, you'll know that unless we're trying to defy the laws of physics, then I don't understand why it couldn't happen. And I look at places like Martinsville, Richmond, Bristol, maybe some of the mile and a half that have great drainage to say, if we had the right rain tires, why couldn't we race in the rain? I know there's an argument out there from some that say, oh, the fans would not want to watch a race in the rain. Well, as a frequent uh, TV personality at the racetracks who has to do rain fill, I am always surprised by the amount of fans that sit in the stands when there's nothing happening on track and it's simply just pouring on them. So I think that argument is a bit moot. Also, people like to say, well, you couldn't possibly drive on a banked course in the rain. Uh, then I would show you the Rolex 24 at Daytona where amongst those multiple classes of race cars, they all drive on the banking when it's raining because the banking kind of self-cleans that water. Hmm. The biggest problem with racing rain is normally standing water for race cars. That's when sanctioned bodies have to basically stop the race because there's too much standing water and the cars cannot stay on the racetrack. I think if we really wanted to, we could possibly race stock cars in the rain and I think it'd be a pretty cool show on an oval. If you agree with that, please let me know in the comments. And if you disagree, I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. But I want to hear from you guys and ask you the same question. Am I on crazy pills? Anyway, and then there's this. Here comes Young Money to the inside. Can't make it work. Two to go. Zeb Wise again down low. Larson trying the outside in turns one and two. Can't do it. Here he comes again. Trying to throw the slider on the 39 BC. White flag is out. Wise back to the inside in turn one. Chris Windham in third. Kyle Larson to second. Does he have anything for him in turn number three? Larson will slide up. They almost touch. They race to the stripe and Seb Wise wins here at the action track. Sounding like a broken record, but this show is all about you. I appreciate everyone who has wrote in using hashtag in the wall. So let's go through a couple of those comments, starting with the Austin Cheney. Love the show, wish I got paid to talk racing like this. Me too, I'm pretty happy about it. Keep it up, as a driver, do you prefer high downforce, low horsepower racing, or vice versa, hashtag in the wall. Uh, as a driver, and I'll say, every driver will say this, we want 1,000 horsepower and absolutely no aerodynamic help whatsoever. The problem is, race teams are too smart, engineers are too smart, and as a, as a sport, we are too smart, and therefore, no matter what rules we come up with, we are never gonna have zero downforce and a thousand horsepower because teams will find ways to make aerodynamics work for them. So, in my perfect world, yes, there would be no such thing as aerodynamics, and we would just have all the horsepower in the world, and we'd be out there wheeling it like crazy, but 
Uh, I don't think that's going to happen at the highest levels. If you want to see that, watch uh, non-wing sprint cars. They're pretty close to that sort of definition. All right, Qu uh, comment number two on the transfer. Hey, at Pete Kligerman and hashtag in the wall, what has the prep been like for you leading up to Watkins Glen? And how do you and the sponsors choose which tracks you're going to run? Hashtag don't forget your keys. That's in reference to me getting locked out of my apartment at uh, about 1 a.m. last night, and uh, hence I didn't sleep for like 21 hours and had to drink huge coffee before this show. Uh, how do we pick our races? Well, Marty Gaunt and myself and the whole team look at the schedule and we decide, all right, where can we run well? Well, that's super speedways. That's road courses and some of the mile and a half we feel like with our multiple grooves. Then we go to sponsors like... TRD, 40th anniversary paint scheme that we'll be running at Watkins Glen this week, uh, and say to them, would you sponsor us at those races? And they say yes, and so on and so forth, and then we go to them. So it's really a combination of us wanting to be able to race at places we like and think we can run well, and places that we know we can be sponsored there. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Uh, all right, moving on to the third comment that we have here from Ferris Khalil. Maybe NASCAR should award the best iRacing drivers a scholarship into racing. That would help with the cost barriers into real racing. I love this. It is happening around the world. You're seeing it in all sorts of different esports competitions involving motorsports where the drivers are eventually given a chance to go and drive a real car, maybe test, maybe be given an actual ride. I think all those things that bridge the gap are a great thing for esports and a great thing for motorsports. So I want to see more of that. And maybe on the NASCAR side, we will eventually get to that point. It's not possible now, but I, don't, I wouldn't say it's not going to happen very soon in the future. Stay tuned. All right. So there's been lots of chatter on sim racing. You guys do love it. I love that. Thanks for all the positive comments. But, of course, haters are going to hate. So like this. Red Dog. Enough of Parker. Good grief. Huh. Anyway, I do appreciate MCARD1204 and David Honks TV with the quick, witty replies that they had. But, no, still not going anywhere. I'm here. Especially this weekend where you'll see me racing at Watkins Glen in that very car right there. We've made some tweaks to it so it's a little faster than Sonoma, at least I hope, because uh, we weren't very fast at Sonoma and finished 30th. Um, so if we can do better than that, I'll be very happy and I think we've made the right improvements to make it uh, faster. So, and once again, that's why I'm wearing this shirt. Um, another mean comment here from Brett C. And he said, listening to Park Kligren makes me want to put my head hashtag in the wall. Well, Brett, you're going to have to listen to me for another hour later here on NASCAR America. Thanks for that comment. Hmm. Not sure about that. Anyway, that's the show. Uh, please write in using hashtag in the wall or hit me directly on Twitter or Instagram at P. Kligerman. Be a part of this show. It's about you, as you can see here. And remember, subscribe to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube channel and check out NBCSports.com for more motorsports content. Thanks for watching. I'm going racing.